Today we are going to discuss layers of the atmosphere and weather. If you recall, there are five separate layers of the atmosphere. The troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and the thermosphere is actually broken into two separate layers, one called the ionosphere, which lies at the bottom of the thermosphere, and the other one is the exosphere, which is at the top of the thermosphere. Here are some characteristics of each layer. First of all, our atmosphere is like a big blanket of gas that surrounds the earth and it keeps us warm. The air that we breathe contains 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. Now the first layer of the atmosphere is the troposphere. It's the layer that's closest to the earth and it's about 11 miles thick. This layer contains most of the water vapor and air and oxygen in our atmosphere and almost all of the weather that occurs on earth takes place here. The next layer up is the stratosphere. The stratosphere um, contains the ozone layer. The ozone protects us from harmful rays from the sun and the ozone layer is increasing due to pollution so this can cause health problems. The bottom of the stratosphere is cold extremely cold and the top layer is closer to zero degrees Celsius. So the stratosphere is a cold place but it actually gets warmer as you rise to the top. Weather balloons kind of hang out here in the stratosphere so that the images can be seen from the top of storms and tornadoes and hurricanes. The next layer up is the mesosphere. And this is the coldest place on Earth. When meteors fall out of the sky and travel through the mesosphere, they burn up. Without this layer, then the meteorites would hit the Earth and we would look like the moon. The next layer is the thermosphere and it's the hottest place on Earth. It's very thin air up there and temperatures can reach thousands of degrees. Now the thermosphere is broken up into two distinct layers. The lowest layer of the thermosphere is called the ionosphere. This is where the International Space Station is housed and this is where satellites orbit. Those satellites send um, radio waves back to Earth. This is also where you might see aurora borealis, those lights that travel in the northern skies. Exosphere is the highest layer of the thermosphere. It's the outermost part of space. And this is where you would find other moons and planets and the sun. Now, this graphic shows you the order of each layer, how many miles apart they are above sea level, as well as the air temperature air pressure rates above sea level. Now temperature decreases that means it gets colder as altitude increases in parts of our atmosphere. If we look at this picture you'll see down here in the troposphere it's warmer the closer you are to earth and as you rise in the troposphere the temperatures get a little bit colder. Now as you enter the stratosphere those temperatures get a little bit warmer, but then they get cold as you go higher up in the stratosphere. Once you reach the mesosphere, the temperatures remain cold, and then once you hit the thermosphere, the temperatures get hot again. This graphic shows what air pressure looks like on Earth. When you're at sea level there's high air pressure as depicted by these these atoms that are pressing down um, on this guy at the bottom of the mountain. As he rises up the top of the mountain there's fewer air molecules pushing down on him. So there's less pressure the higher you go in our troposphere and there's more pressure the lower you go in our tro troposphere. 
So that pressure that we're talking about is called air pressure. It's the weight of air molecules pushing down on Earth. And again, air pressure decreases as altitude increases. Scientists use barometers to study air pressure, and this is a picture of a barometer. Now, another weather factor that we're going to discuss is humidity. This is moisture or water vapor in our air. The more water in the air, the higher the humidity. When you have low humidity, you get dry weather conditions. And you might see this in the wintertime. You might see this in a desert area. High humidity means that there's clouds or fog in the area. And high humidity can occur any time of the year. The tool that scientists use to measure humidity is called a psychrometer. Another term that might be used is a hygrometer. It's like taking two thermometers, one with a wet bulb and one with a dry bulb, and comparing them once it's outside. You look at how much moisture is in the air, um, how much moisture gets soaked up in this wet cloth, and you compare it to the actual temperature outside. Now, heat from the surface of the clouds. We're going to talk about how clouds are formed, but we have to understand where the energy is coming from. So, as you all know, warm air rises. And when that warm air rises, it gets absorbed by clouds that are in the sky. Um, some of that heat is then transferred to the atmosphere. Some of it goes into deep space. Some of it rises just above the clouds and it gets cold. And, you know, cold air is dense. So then it sinks back down to earth and the cycle starts all over again. But once that warm air rises and it forms droplets, those droplets become the cloud. Um, the water droplets that get colder they form all kinds of precipitation, and that precipitation could fall as rain, snow, sleet, or hail. Cloud formation. As bodies of water and land absorb thermal energy, the water evaporates, and it causes the air to be warm and moist. Warm, moist air is less dense than cold, dry air, so that warm air is going to rise. As the warm air rises, it gives off that thermal energy that we saw in the previous graphic. It condenses and it forms clouds. These So clouds are very minute condensed water particles. That's all they are. The amounts of thermal energy and water vapor in the air and the pressure of the air determine what weather conditions are going to be like. Clouds are important indicators of atmospheric conditions. Clouds are found at various levels in our troposphere, and the three main types of clouds are cumulus, stratus, and cirrus. So if you look at the different layers that we have in our troposphere, you have lower clouds, medium clouds, and high clouds. Stratus clouds, those low-lying clouds that bring fair weather, they are seen in the lower levels of the troposphere. Stratus clouds are almost like blankets that cover the sky. You might get cloudy weather, you might get a little rain or drizzle with stratus clouds. Cumulus clouds are somewhere between the lower and middle levels. Those are those big puffy white clouds that you see in the sky. And then the cirrus clouds, which are actually ice crystals, they are higher up in our troposphere. Now, any of these clouds can combine to bring about different types of weather. Here you see a cumulonimbus cloud, nimbo meaning um, rain, rainy weather. And so when you get cumulonimbus clouds, you might get thunderstorms and even lightning. Let's talk about fronts. Fronts are just air masses that are moving from one area to another. And you can have a cold air mass or you can have a warm air mass. 
Cold air is usually heavier, so it always makes warm air rise or it pushes in and pushes the warm air out of the way. A warm front is the zone separating two air masses, where the lighter, warmer air is advancing and replacing the cold air. So here you can see warm air rising over the cold air, pushing it out of the way. A warm front is depicted by a red line with red dots on it. And you can see the temperatures that are moving in, 55 to 62 degrees, are warmer than the temperatures that were there previously. These temperatures range from 28 to 31 degrees. The dots indicate the direction that the warm front is moving in. So this warm front is coming in, it's moving in a northeast direction. A cold front is the zone separating two air masses where the cooler, denser air mass is advancing and replacing the warmer air mass. Here you see these colder temperatures are replacing these warmer temperatures. A cold front is depicted by a blue line with dark blue triangles. And here, this cold front is moving in a southeast direction. A stationary front is a boundary between two different air masses, neither of which is strong enough to replace the other, so they move very slowly or they don't move at all. So this is a stationary front where cold air is meeting warm air, and neither one of them can push the other. And it's depicted by both the red dots and the blue triangles. The warm air is moving in the direction that you see the red dots in, and that's a northwest direction. The cold air is moving in a southeast direction, and those triangles are pointing in that direction. An occluded front is a front formed when a cold front overtakes a warm front, and it forces the warm air up. This usually signals the end of a storm. So here's cold air moving in, moving through, and that warm air rises. An occluded front is depicted by showing the warm air moving out of the way, the cold air replacing it, and where they meet, you would see purple dots and triangles instead of your typical red and blue triangles. Now let's talk about what type of weather fronts bring. A warm front brings light showers that end with warm temperatures and clearing skies. A cold front brings showers and gusty winds and sometimes thunderstorms, and it's usually followed by cold, dry air. A stationary front brings cloudy weather accompanied by drizzly and sometimes heavy rain for an extended period of time. That's when you have those weekends or those weekdays where it just seems like it rains forever. And it's not bad, but it's just uh, days and days of rain. That's because one front is not strong enough to move the other front out of the way. And an occluded front is a complex weather condition ranging from all types of fronts associated with the occluded front. So you could have cold air moving in and warm air rising. And the temperature usually gets cold after that. Or you could have had a cold front move in on a warm front and then another one move in right afterwards. A couple of weather tools that we use to measure these weather conditions are weather vanes. We see these on buildings of all types and they measure wind direction. The next type is an anemometer. Scientists use this to measure wind speed. Here are a couple of symbols that you might see on a weather map. Um, we've already discussed the warm, cold, stationary, and occluded fronts. Here's what high and low air pressure systems look like. A high pressure system com comes in and it usually brings sunny weather. A low pressure system comes in and it usually brings rain. When you look at a weather map, um, you might see symbols pertaining to a different location. You could see symbols that indicate clear weather, sunny weather, cloudy weather, overcast weather, thunderstorms, and all types of precipitation. This graphic here represents a weather forecast, and it could tell you your highs and your lows for the week.
or even a month. Now, some of the severe weather conditions that you've learned throughout the years are thunderstorms, hurricanes, tornadoes, sleet, and freezing rain. Tornadoes are formed where the land is strongly heated. I'm sorry, thunderstorms are formed where the land is strongly heated, and they can bring rain, hail, and cloudy weather to an area. Hurricanes form over warm tropical water and they're fed by the energy of that water. They usually start off the coast of Africa and they travel west. That's why the east coast of the United States receives lots of hurricanes. Tornadoes are strong storms that form over land and they develop into high winds and it usually causes destruction in an area. Sometimes we call them twisters and tornadoes usually form in Tornado Alley, which is the central part of the United States. Sleet is a type of precipitation that falls from the sky and it freezes once it hits a colder surface. Um, sleet is what we sometimes refer to as black ice. You can't see it because it's rain that has just fallen but the ground is so cold that it freezes upon contact. And then freezing rain is precipitation that falls from the sky and hits the ground as ice. In Virginia, we have um, average winter temperatures in the central and western part of our state that are colder than the temperatures along the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. And that's because of thermal energy. Um, there's specific heat that the ocean has gathered over the summer months and all winter long it slowly releases that heat so you will see this area of the state typically warmer in the winter times than this area of our state. And you can stop the tape now. This ends our layers of the atmosphere and weather unit.